information comes to light or some new phrase or piece of video that will be perfect in an exhibition. I've particularly enjoyed learning about the cycle cars and the damsels of design who will be the subject of the next um, uh, talk in this series. And I think you will enjoy what Shoshana has to say um, today and to share. Please allow me to introduce Shoshana Reznikov and her take on Quite the Pet of Cranbrook, James Scripps Booth, and the early car. Well, I will second Roberta's um, thank you for coming out on a day like this and in weather like this. It's true that I had two years in Chicago, but um, Michigan is giving me uh, its own weather challenges, and so I appreciate anyone willing to make the trek. And, and with that, thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, I, I actually, what, one of the great benefits to, to this fellowship, um, besides obviously getting to work with the amazing staff here as well as the phenomenal collections, uh, is that we get to live on campus. So I actually walked here today, um, but I'm assuming that most of you didn't. Um, so can we start with a show of hands? Uh, how many drove? Yeah, that, that seems about right. Um, getting to Cranbrook almost always requires a car. Sure, once you pull in and you find a parking spot, although sometimes good luck with that, uh, you can get out, you can stroll around the campus and enjoy all of the beauty during winter or during summer. But getting here, whether from downtown or from the metro suburbs, definitely requires an automobile. So while we can talk for hours about the social and historical impact of the, of the car on American society, and I have done that and I'm happy to do that with anyone who's interested in it, the truth is actually right here in front of us. This historic arts community, this place that was designed to be an artistic refuge from the city, it couldn't be what it is today without the car. At its most basic level, Cranbrook is a product of the automobile. But the exhibition outside in DeSalle and this talk today makes an argument for a slightly different perspective. If Cranbrook, like Detroit, was built around the autom automobile, so too can we argue that Cranbrook, like Detroit, helped to build the automobile. I'd like to take a moment, though, to make it very clear that I am not trying to argue that for Cranbrook's inclusion at the center of the automotive universe. That's reserved for people like Henry Ford, car companies like the Big Three, schools like CCS or Pasadena's Art Center. Cranbrook is not operating at that level, mostly because automobiles were never Cranbrook's focus. It's just not what we did here for the past 100 years. But despite that, Cranbrook sits geographically on the outer edge of Metro Detroit and, I argue, existed within the constellation of Detroit institutions that influenced the automobile industry as well, shaping the history of the American car. A driving force, Cranbrook and the car, attempts to encapsulate two periods in Cranbrook's history in which community members were especially active in this field. For today, though, I really want to focus on just one of those periods. In the exhibition, we argue that Cranbrook's involvement with the car predates the organized community as we know it. Cranbrook's engagement with the automotive industry began, I believe, with its metaphoric first son, James Scripps Booth. James Scripps Booth was born in 1888 in his grandparents' house on Trumbull Avenue in Detroit. In 1904, George and Ellen Booth purchased a farm in Bloomfield Hills Township, and four years later, they moved here to this site with their five children into the Albert Kahn designed Cranbrook House. James Scripps Booth was 20 years old by the time Kahn completed the house, but he was still definitely an integral part of Cranbrook home life. An artist, he painted the decoration on the Pompeian style plaster as a ceiling in Cranbrook's still room, and was responsible, at least according to family lore, for a number of accidental renovations including breaking down a wall with sledgehammers and shaving the finials off of the dining room chairs. His sphere of influence extended far beyond Cranbrook, however. Over the course of his life, James Scripps Booth developed innovations that continue to shape the way we experience modern American life. He introduced Detroit's V8 engine, designed the first ready-to-use spare wheel and tire. He was even the first to mount a horn button onto the steering wheel, a development that, whether we like it or not, is now a hallmark of the American driving experience. So uh, during rush hour, you can thank him for that. Booth's designs represent both an automotive past rife with possibilities and potential, and also illustrate an almost eerie foresight into the automotive needs of the future. James Scripps Booth's passion for automobiles emerged at a young age. 
As a child, he worked tirelessly to convince his father, George, to acquire a family vehicle, eventually overseeing their purchase of a 1904 Winton touring car and teaching the family to drive it. Driving wasn't enough, however. A lifelong adherent of the idea of learning by doing, he took apart the car and rebuilt it many times over, teaching himself the inner workings of the vehicle. He also acted as the family's chauffeur, driving his siblings and parents out into the country, and even getting a speeding ticket in Birmingham for motoring at a pace, quote, faster than horses could walk. The ticket fine was $10, which actually seems sort of steep to me, given, given the conversion, but you know, whatever. An active tinker and a dedicated artist, he dropped out of school after 10th grade. It was thus an almost entirely self-educated, I should say, Booth who began working on his first car in 1908. With more enthusiasm and zeal than sense, perhaps, Booth took on his first automotive design challenge in the challenge of designing one of the largest two-wheeled sports cars in the world. Called the Biotigo, this two-wheeled three-seater took five years and over $20,000 to build. The design began with drawings done at Cranbrook in 1908 and was further developed during a year spent traveling in Europe. In 1912, he finalized these designs and, renting out space at the Curry Machine Shop in Detroit, began work on the chassis and body. The production of the vehicle was partially financed by his uncle, William E. Scripps. It wasn't until May of 1913, however, when Booth took the Biotigo out for its first road test. He would eventually drive it from downtown Detroit up Woodward all the way to Cranbrook. Which, you know, sometimes in the bad weather, it takes me a very long time to make it from downtown Detroit to, to Cranbrook, and I can only imagine what it would have been like on a two-wheeled car of that size with very little paved road. Weighing approximately 3,200 pounds, the Biotigo featured, featured an aluminum body, 37-inch wood spoked wheels, and over 450 feet of copper piping used to cool its considerable engine. The engine was an innovation itself. The first V8 built in Detroit, it beat Cadillac by one year. Booth would have been exposed to V8 engines in France during his European travels, and it's clear that he jumped at the opportunity to build one here and install it in this pretty incredible machine. I think there's really no question that a car like this is going to be a gas guzzler. And the Biotigo featured not one, but two gas tanks that held a combined 26 gallons. A machine so large, meanwhile, uh, makes maneuvering with only two wheels a bit of a challenge. To solve that problem, Booth installed two outrigger wheels on either side of the back wheel. And you can see them better right there. To help stabilize the, the vehicle at low speeds. Despite its heft, James Scripps Booth reported that the motorcycle could achieve speeds of up to 75 miles per hour. Um, I, I don't, I'm trusting him on this. I don't know how we would, we would prove whether that was true or not. It sounds very fast on a machine that large, but also sounds like it would be a lot of fun. Other Biotigo innovations include the first wheel-mounted horn button, door hinges that were hidden from view, as well as a folding armrest. Though innovative in any number of ways, this oversized motorcycle also had a few unique problems. First, handling. At 3,200 pounds and with no power steering in sight, steering the vehicle was prohibitively difficult. But even if you could manage to steer it, what you were heading into might still be a problem. While the first mile of paving in America was laid down on Woodward Avenue in 1909, the majority of the roads in the Detroit metro area remain unpaved for quite a bit longer. Getting the Biotigo to move on its two wheels through the mud and muck of the country roads and the uneven brick of the city proved to be quite a challenge. Finally, the cost to produce the Biotigo meant that mass production was pretty much out of the question. Between its size, lack of utility, and high price tag, the Biotigo never really stood a chance as a production vehicle. I don't imagine that this really phased James Scripps Booth, though, who seemed to view the Biotigo as more of an engineering challenge than a mass market creation. It was an opportunity to prove to himself and to the world that all these components, a massive two-wheeled vehicle, a V8 engine, outrigger wheels, twin gas tanks, and on and on, could come together into a working car. In his handbook for the Biotigo, written some 30 years later and reading something as something of a mixture of a, of a guide to the car and a memoir, Booth reminisces that in designing the Biotigo, he probably bit off more than he could chew. The challenge, though, was irresistible, and he met it with what I think we can agree is a truly unique vehicle. 
And the Biotigo is currently in the collection of the Detroit Historical Museum. And while it has been on long-term loan to the Owl's Head Transportation Museum, there are talks to bring this vehicle back to Detroit and put it on view, something that I think many of us would really love to see. Another interesting thing to note, while the Biotigo never led to a commercial line, it clearly held importance to Booth's own personal narrative. When his daughter was born, for instance, he wrote a note informing his father of her birth on the back of stationery branded with the name and the image of the Biotigo. His least marketable vehicle, in some ways it best represented this young man's identity as a designer who pushed the limits of what a vehicle was capable of simply for the joy of finding out what would happen. If the Biotigo was oversized and unlikely to be mass manufactured, James Scripps Booth's next project was its antithesis. Booth traveled extensively in Europe, spending considerable time between 1908 and 1912 in England and on the continent. It was there that he likely came in contact with a fad that was sweeping Europe and would soon jump the Atlantic to the US, the cycle car. Small, inexpensive, and easy to fix, the cycle car was meant to be the everyman's vehicle, a cheap and easily manufactured response to the massive luxury vehicles produced by Packard and Rolls-Royce for the money to lead. Powered by a single cylinder or V-twin engines adopted from motorcycles and utilizing chain or belt drives, cycle cars used affordable, easily available parts and lightweight bodies to keep prices low. Cycle cars were ideal cars for the average city dweller. Built more like engine-powered bicycles or motorcycles than cars, the average owner could repair it himself. Their size meant that one could easily store it without requiring an elaborate garage setup, something that would increase the cost of ownership, car ownership in a city. Cycle cars had their downsides, of course. Made with as little material as possible, they were uncomfortable, rickety, and at times even dangerous. Inspired by the vehicles he saw in Europe and the burgeoning market in the United States, James Scripps Booth threw his metaphoric hat in the ring and, following the completion of the Biotigo, created the Scripps Booth Cycle Car Company. Founded in partnership with his cousin, engineer John Batterman, and funded in part, again, by Uncle William Scripps, the company quickly produced the prototype JB Rocket. Currently in the collection of the Henry Ford, the prototype rocket spawned the commercial, the commercial JB Rocket, and eventually the packet, a larger cycle car meant for trans transporting goods as well as people. James Scripps Booth was understandably very proud of his vehicle, calling it elemental cheap transportation for the working man. And he and Batter Batterman entered it into races across the country. You can see one of the articles about those races here. The Scripps Booth rocket was also considered one of the better, vehicle, the better cycle cars on the market. Consistently winning races, it was better sprung and had a less bumpy ride. Oh, pardon me. Um, you can see uh, the rocket that we have on view right here, and it's also right outside. In 1914, the average price of a rocket was $385, far below the price of a full-size car. Unfortunately for Booth, Batterman, and the cycle car industry, however, that wasn't the case for long. I think we all know what's coming in this story. Uh, the Model T. The Model T price comes down, and the cycle car falls out of fashion. With the everyman enthusiastically purchasing Henry Ford's affordable, mass-produced, full-size car, the cycle car industry falls apart. Only one year after its founding, the Scripps Booth Cycle Car Company closes up shop, and the cycle car is relegated to a fad of the past. The rocket is currently uh, on view in our gallery um, and is also in the collection of the Detroit Historical Museum. It was on long-term loan to Owl's Head Transportation Museum until we had it transported here for the show. It has a, a V-twin spec engine and a belt drive. Um, one of my favorite things about working in museums is uh, making the effort to, to take the curatorial process and making it a little less opaque and explaining a little bit about why the things that we end up choosing show up in the museum. Um, and when we were working on this exhibition, I was very passionate about getting the Biotigo into this gallery. Um, I, I was trying as hard as I could, and we were in talks with the Detroit Historical Museum, we were in talks with Owl's Head, um, and we, we was getting down to issues like how wide is it, can it fit through the doors, you know, how does it even maneuver on two wheels, there's, there's a complicated path to get from one place to another within this museum, how would we, how would we move it? Until someone, I think it was our exhibition designer, said, well, what about how much it weighs? It weighs 3,200 pounds. Can the floor in the gallery even take all of that weight, especially on two wheels? So we ended up calling in a structural engineer. And the structural engineer looked at the galleries 
and we were all, I, I should say, I was crossing my fingers, just sort of like praying, like, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Um, and his report comes back, and lo and behold, we actually can get the bio to go into that gallery. The floor can take 3,200 pounds, but that's pretty much all it can take, which means that if we put the bio to go in that gallery, we couldn't have visitors in that gallery. Um, I don't want to curate shows that people can't see. So I very sadly said goodbye to my, to my wishes of getting the bio to go in this gallery and switched over to the rocket, which, you know, coming in at some 700 pounds or something was, was a piece of cake, just rolled right in. Um, but what I realized later was that it was actually a blessing in disguise. The Biotigo is this incredible one-off, this, this accident almost, this, um, this engineering marvel. And it doesn't tell the story of car production, car manufacturing. This is a production vehicle. And it tells the story of just how influential and involved James Griff's booth was in the automotive industry at this time. Um, and so even though at first the rocket was my second choice, in the end I've really come to embrace it and I think it has become the, the touchstone for this exhibition in a lot of ways. So I guess this is a thank you to James Scripps Booth for making the biotigo really, really heavy. Following the closing of the Scripps Booth Cycle Car Company, Booth quickly shifted to a different audience. Having designed an experimental vehicle in the biotigo and affordable cars for the masses with the rocket, he turned his attention to the luxury market. In late 1914, he established the Scripps Booth Company with the express intent of producing luxurious vehicles without sacrificing speed for comfort. In the opening months of 1915, he debuted the Scripps Booth Model C, visible here at the Cranbrook Garage. Uh, that's his father in the hat, sort of hidden by the windshield. Working with engineer William Bushnell Stout, whom he met through cousin and business partner John Batterman, he focused on creating a car that was small and light, an alternative to the luxury vehicles available on the market. As expensive family car vehicles were getting larger and larger, Booth was determined to keep his cars compact and zippy. Marketing was central to the early success of the Scripps Booth Company. Their advertisements sold a lifestyle as much as they sold cars, and they reflected Booth's understanding of his fellow young, wealthy Americans and Europeans. As an artist, Booth designed the majority of these advertisements. In these pre preparatory oil paintings, he highlights the ideal lifestyle of the Scripps Booth owner. Elegant, but also sporty, these paintings suggest that the driver of a Scripps Booth might be just as likely to take their vehicle out for a jaunt in the countryside as they would be to drive it to the theater or even the opera. That approach carries over into Booth's print advertisements. Showing off the Scripps Booth owner's sportsmanship, Booth illustrates a luxurious, easy lifestyle that, according to the advertisements, comes hand in hand with the ownership of a Scripps booth. Um, there's another set of advertisements that are also produced in this period, and it's uh, quite frankly one of my favorite. Um, uh, it takes a, a slightly different position. Uh, in this one, we're conflating the car with the rugged honesty of Abraham Lincoln and the rigid honesty of the Puritans. Um, and so you're really getting the sense that buying a Scripps Booth automobile is, is buying into America's past and investing sort of in American pride. This is truly lifestyle marketing uh, at its finest in these early stages, and, and Booth was integral to all of it. The Scripps Booth Model Z did well in, in the US, but found an unexpectedly open market in Europe. The King of Spain, Queen of Holland, and even Winston Churchill all claimed a Scripps booth as their own. And a Pittsburgh Press article in 1915 quoted an English automobile enthusiast, and I will take also a moment to say that out of all of the research I've done for this exhibition, this might be my absolute favorite thing. This automobile enthusiast explained, there has been a great deal of fun in your newspapers concerning Europeans who come to America for wives. The sting lying in the suggestion that they come only for the dot, or money, that goes with the girl. There is a lot of rot to that. American girls represent something, the power and freshness of the new world galvanized into beauty and style. And it is just because the makers of this dainty yet powerful Scripps booth have been able to put into this product the same quality that we in Europe want the car. As an American girl, I guess I'm flattered. We have power and freshness galvanized into beauty and style. Uh, but also the, the idea of a car being compared to a girl as early as 1915 is I think also very compelling. The English publication, The Auto Car, meanwhile, explained that British motorists have been avid followers of the light car movement. The Scripps booth is a nice car to handle, its external finish and equipment are excellent, and the car is essentially quiet. 
Scripps Booth Innovations included the first spare wheel and tire fitted to the back of the vehicle, as well as the first steering wheel horn button mounted on a commercially sold vehicle. The Biotigo, as we mentioned, was never sold commercially. The Model C also featured the first electrical door lock system, though it was imperfect and prone to failure, and was eventually replaced with a more traditional lock system. Scripps Booth later got the electrical locks right on a coupe that the company produced, however. Another innovation was the step-down frame that made entrance and exit easier, something that was improved in a later design as well. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. The Scripps Booth company wasn't all smooth sailing, however. Early problems with the factory led to a delay in production, setting a tone that would continue throughout the run of the company. When the directors of the company chose to produce a large four-seater V8 rather than the Vitesse, a sporty racer that Booth had been championing, Booth began to withdraw from the firm. And here is an image of the Vitesse. At the end of 1916, after the Scripps Booth Company absorbed Sterling Motor Company and became a corporation, Booth resigned. He watched from afar as Scripps Booth cars became bigger and bulkier, matching the rest of the market. In 1917, Scripps Booth was absorbed by Chevrolet, which in turn merged with General Motors. GM continued to produce Scripps cars until 1922, when they retired the line. After his retreat from the commercial car company bearing his name, Booth watched as his company was absorbed and then eventually retired. By the time GM did retire the, the Scripps Booth line, Booth was only 34. With a young family and a parallel career as an artist, he can be forgiven for taking a step back from the automotive industry, especially one that embraced and then rejected him by turn. His break didn't last long, however, and in 1923, he began work on a car that he saw as his masterpiece. Appropriately named the Da Vinci, the car incorporated Booth's greatest hits, electric door locks, a V8 engine, and that step-down frame that makes ease for easy entrance and exit. The low frame was made possible by a worm drive that allowed the car to sit closer to the ground, giving it a lower center of gravity and making for a safer driving experience. It also featured a remote hood release, and uh, all of this was on a 106-inch wheelbase, proving that Booth's passion for small vehicles would remain alive and well. In 1925, Booth went to work building the Da Vinci. Doing most of the work in Louis Chevrolet's shop in Indianapolis, he ultimately ended up spending $100,000 producing the prototype. He considered founding yet another company to manufacture and market the Da Vinci, but ultimately chose to a different path. Understandably exhausted with the politics and administration of founding an independent automobile company, and perhaps also recognizing that the days of the small car company were coming to a close, Booth chose to shop his design around to existing companies rather than create a new one from the ground up. In a letter to Edsel Ford, Booth extolled the virtues of the Da Vinci, saying, there isn't any doubt but what your organization can and will turn out a very wonderful automobile with many pleasant surprises, and there's every reason why you should. But nevertheless, I dare to believe my layouts include a number of ideas you should either have in your car or at least know about. Booth showed the Da Vinci to a number of companies, but it was Stutz that expressed the most interest before eventually passing on the car. One year later, however, at a 1926 automotive show in New York, Booth saw the safety Stutz. Featuring a worm drive and lower frame, it was disturbingly similar to the Da Vinci. With his, with his design effectively already on the market, Booth gave up, finding, uh, gave up on finding funding for the Da Vinci and stewed Stutz for patent infringement instead. The lawsuit took a whole seven years to resolve, and when he won it at the end, he found the victory was somewhat of a Pyrrhic one. Now bankrupt, Stutz could only pay out $40,000, which was just about enough to cover his, his very extensive legal fees. Here you can see the Da Vinci's logo and out on, or the emblem, and out on in the exhibition you can actually see an earlier design for this as well. And I include this um, just to illustrate how much work went into this car at, at every level and, and how devoted he truly was to it. Um, he has his classic um, uh, artist palette incorporated behind the, the white disc behind the DV to, to indicate just uh, how artistic all of these endeavors are and his own uh, personal career as an artist, as well as a gear. So he's once again incorporating art and engineering into everything he does and designing this car at just about every level. The Da Vinci, unfortunately, was James Scripps Booth's final attempt at a commercial automobile. He returned to the Da Vinci again and again, changing its body to show off different features of the design. The Da Vinci is actually currently owned by a collector in Indianapolis who has been working on and off of it, working on it on and off, I should say, since 2001. 
Despite having taken a step back from the commercial industry, however, Booth continued to design cars over the course of his life. In 1930, he returned to the idea of the cycle car, going back to where he'd started, uh, in the form of the Da Vinci Pup. Designed and built for his personal use, the Pup is made of aluminum over a wood body and weighs 1,250 pounds. A two-seater like the Rocket, it was supposedly capable of reaching speeds of 90 miles per hour. It's currently also in the collection of the Detroit Historical Museum. So what does this all mean? I'm, I'm a social historian by training, um, and so I like, to take, I like to look at these stories and think about how they reflect uh, the, larger, um, the larger trends of, this time, of a given time period. And I think what we can kind of conclude from all of this is that James Scripps Booth was a man caught between worlds. An independent car designer, he existed at this early and never repeated moment in automotive history, when smaller car companies and independent thinkers were able to help shape the future of the American car in a way that they would never be able to do so again. However, he also was at the moment when that was coming to an end, when the, the larger car companies were consolidating power and consolidating money and capital, and it became harder and harder to design cars independently and successfully. At the same time, his passion for small cars put him, quite honestly, decades ahead of his time. With concerns over automotive size, mileage, and the waste involved in car production today, Booth's vision for small, agile cars would fit in just right, though obviously his engineering would have to catch up with the times. In his period, though, the trend was moving toward larger, more substantial cars, and his designs could do little to stop that movement. Here at Cranbrook, though, he was right where he was supposed to be. His love for automobiles is writ large over the landscape and the built environment. When he first tested the rocket prototype, he did so right here on campus. He wrote a letter to a friend explaining that the cycle car had, quote, become quite the pet of Cranbrook as it careened over the hills of his parents' estate. He tinkered in his parents' garage and even went so far as to imprint his love, his passion onto the very walls of the building in the form of his automotive murals. Like many of the smaller car companies and designers of this period, James Scripps Booth has been left, out of, left behind by our national automotive history narrative. Here at Cranbrook, though, he's a central first step in the relationship between Cranbrook and the car. Thank you all very much.